So first of all, we'd like to say welcome to John Ferris to In Excess Access All Areas. Uh, thank you for coming on, John. Thanks. Great to be here. We and, have... and thanks for giving me access to all areas. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a very good friend of yours uh, recommend you as a potential good host, uh, Simon Yo uh, from England. Simon Yo. How yeah. did you hook up with Simon? I know. We interviewed Simon about a year ago and he says hi. I spoke to him this morning and uh, he said he's got some camo hats for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's, what's the what's the tie-in? What's the context? With Simon? Okay. Okay. So we, I mean, our podcast, uh, uh, and again, if you haven't heard about it, we are doing a retrospective of 1977 to uh, 2012 of In Excess. You are... Uh, episode i think 125 so we've done this for two years and about 20 weeks so episode seven was dedicated to you and everything that you have done within the band and we're doing a comprehensive deep dive on everything through with the band friendships we've had mark opitz on five or six times we've had nick egan on three or four times we've had tim tim your brother on two or three um the only one we have nick lornay (laughs) nick lornay a couple of weeks ago (laughs) Um, Richard Clapton, a good friend of yours and obviously uh, an important mm. guy in your career. Um, and we just want to, I think there's two parts or themes to this. One is to help get you guys in the Rock Hall of Fame. Not that vanity prevails, we just think it's something's deserved. It. And secondly, we'd like to sort of right some wrongs and get a full, accurate chronology of what In Excess was about rather than just the kick album. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. That's in a nutshell what we're doing. And uh, Kirk did say, how can you come up with 50 episodes about us, let alone 100? But <laughs> we've, we've somehow managed it, et cetera, there. So we'll we'll sort of fire away. We, we've we sort of worked on this theme, and I, I've done a bit of research, but um, I'd like to work backwards. And 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 I, I assume that obviously being in Byron and up in the hinterland there, yeah. um, you've really had two lives, haven't you? You've had this sort of life in Hong Kong and, and on the road and then this beautiful sort of serene life that seems to have really agreed with you. Um, I guess in a nutshell, uh, how do you enjoy life where you are right now? Because it seems uh, from afar you do uh, very much so, you know? Hey, look, thanks. Look, first of all, let me just say uh, it's really a pleasure to be here on your platform. And uh, thanks for all the stuff you've been doing. And uh, really great that, you, that you're sort of knitting together this interesting web of um, you know, this mesh of, of associated and exist uh, concepts and, and, and conversations. It's really great. So thanks for having me. Um, uh, I, yeah, we, my wife and I, Kerry and I, we moved from Sydney, uh, which I love. Now, that was my favourite city in the world. Um, and having, I would say, a, a pretty good, um, you know, experience of seeing many cities in different countries and living in different places. And, and, and uh, Australia was, was always home, even when I wasn't living in Australia, you know, and Sydney was always my favourite city. But, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, everything's kind of shifting a little bit. Um, personal needs have changed and uh, situations changed. So we just found that we're in the city. We're going, why are we in the city? We, we, we don't need to be in, in you know, uh, at, at work at nine in the morning in some office somewhere. So, um, you know, what, you know, so we started to look at, at country, at, at, in the country, moving the country. And we'd always been down south. We'd been down further down south where uh, Tim's farm was down in Kangaroo Valley and my dad used to live down near there. And we were always heading south, and then my dad moved north. And we're like, "Hey, Dad, you know, we're <laughs> just down." Here. And, and so he went north, and um, at that point, um, then he passed away. So we just decided, well, we're just going to move uh, and just start fresh in a new place. And um, so we're up here close to where Kerry's parents are and Kerry's family. So they're up near, near, um, just on the border of Queensland and New South Wales. So. Where we live is uh, is beautiful. We're in the country. We're, we're you know surrounded by trees and wild animals, uh, including my children, yeah. uh, which we consider wild animals. And yes. me, I'm yes. a pretty wild animal. And and um, but we also have some farm animals. And uh, you know, I'm a great lover of nature and, and just love. Um, I love nature. I'm, I'm a huge. I, you know, just I can't survive unless I'm sort of amongst that. So it's just elevated my whole life into. A wonderful uh, place now because I'm surrounded by all the things I love my family uh, you know animals uh, trees birds uh, green hills and if that's not agreeable to someone then I don't really know why that sure. would not be but I mean ultimately to me that that's what I consider uh, paradise so so yeah we sure. made that happen that was great were you affected by the floods at all because you're quite near Lismore aren't you 
try yeah look it affected everybody and it still is has been affected we're still affected by it uh, mm -hmm. that was absolutely horrific i'd say catastrophic um uh you know it's been a lot going on uh, the floods um were very serious and um it's very sad because a lot, a lot of families and a lot of people who've lived here a long time who just literally uh just had to move out mm -hmm. uh they had these uh, government officials running around condemning houses and, and just telling people, you know, you got to go and they've been there all their lives and, and all their entire lives are ruined. Um, I was in, I was driving down to Sydney when that was all happening and, and it was just like biblical. The rain was mm. absolutely just insane. And I went down to Sydney and then while I was down there, I had an accident and I put my neck out. So I had to come back uh, to sit uh, back up to Byron where I was in traction for about three weeks and that whole time, uh, was when the aftermath of the floods were and my wife, Kerry, was out there helping everybody, you know, like yeah. trying to bring food to people and, and cooking food and, and trying to distribute things that people need. And so that, so, it, it, you know, it's, it, you know, we're, we're recovering. Uh, we were fine because we're elevated. A lot of people aren't. Um, and, yeah, so it's amazing to see a community come together. And, and Sounds uh, like uh, uh, regional Victoria, where I'm based at the moment. You right. Know, um, We've had, you know, these awful floods across Victoria. Yeah, um, I heard. Yeah, uh, which has sort of gone international. We've had a few people say to us, oh, you guys are all right. But, I mean, obviously it's up on the co uh, up on the river, uh, the Murray and the Goulburn and those sort of areas. But it's, um, yeah, probably, uh, you know, we could treat our planet a bit better. We might uh, not have these things, you know, happen that way. Well, look, I mean, I mean, you could you could go down that angle. That seems to be what's on offer. That seems to be the first port of call is what they, uh, you know, they just... Uh, repeat over and over and over if you're someone who watches the television all day long that's what you, your reality will be mm -hmm. uh, if yeah. you turn the television off and do some research you'll find that may not be uh necessarily the case no um, that's right but, but for right. those who who like to uh explore what's more beyond what some guy who's paid to tell you what reality is and, and go beyond that a little bit um you will find that there's a lot more to it than just that <laughs> Uh, and if people are that interested in in um, worrying about that, then then research on your own and get your own information, not from uh, someone who's sponsored to tell you that. Yeah. Yes. No. Correct. Correct. Um, I guess one of your songs that you wrote, "Old World, New World," could almost be the metaphor of yeah. your living life, uh, John. Amazing, Hayden. I, I I was only thinking that a couple of weeks ago. You know, incredible. Absolutely. That is what in. Um, that is what we're experiencing, you know, um, this old world that has been kind of almost replaced by the new world um, is, if you, if you look at that song and then you look at what's happening now, it's exactly what's happening. There's this, there's, there's a spiritual transition and, you know, there's a, collect, a human collective transition from old to new and, and there's a technological transition, you know, but, but really some of the old methods and the old things are, 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 are beautiful and, and don't need changing, you know, like. The craft. Craft, you know, um, basic things, you know, a, a mother to, to child relationship, you know. Mm. Well, in the new world now, then, you know, both parents go out to work and then, you know, they give the kids to the state to, state to bring up. Um, you know, that that is that is becoming, you know, what we call a new world and we think that that's progress. Well, it really isn't. It's actually the opposite direction, you know. So um, I, I look at that that song in the same way, Hayden, in the sense that, you know, it, 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 stirs, um, it stirs one to think. And, and look, I'm a very curious person, so I like to think a lot. And I think very heavily about everything. So... Um, and, and, and I was only thinking just the other day about old world, new world, and how relevant that is. Oh, uh, strange. A lot Before more polarised. What's yeah. happening right now is a lot more polarised, isn't it? We're now just very easy to see now the difference between what we're being served up in terms of let's, let's accept this new thing as opposed, to where, as opposed to where we've come from. And we're only a couple of generations away from um, people who have no idea what that old world was about at all. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, look, uh, that's why I love songwriting. That's why I love songs because there's so much in, in each song that can be, well, I like to think when I'm writing a song, there's, there's more than a couple of meanings, you know? 
Um, John, but... John, we need more than half an hour with you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's really because I talk, I talk too much. I <laughs> Hayden, what else did you want to say? All right. Well, I mean, obviously you've done a little bit of recording with uh, Kieran um, and you put something at the end of last year. Yeah. And um, it seemed from what I could sense from the recording, everything there, I mean, obviously anything you release now probably comes from less commercial intent and probably comes from a, a place of like, I want to add a song to the world that adds value. And, and it's, you're only releasing what you want to release based upon your own desires without commercial record company pressures. So it must be a comfortable place to create music in with that being the dynamic. Yeah, that's a very good um, observation, Hayden. And uh, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, See, I've always written um, music because I felt like I wanted to write it and I had something to say when I wanted to say it. And um, and and I think that's largely what we've always done with In Excess, you know. I mean, In Excess is, is six people who have six very different views on things, uh, six uh, completely, you know, different personalities. I mean, sure, we have similarities and that's, that, that's the, that binding thread that holds us together, but we all have different ways of viewing things. And when you put that together, that, that's what creates the unique, you know, combination of those people. Yeah. But, you know, when, when you're indentured in, in, in all sorts of different um, uh, companies and all these things that help you get where you want to be and, and, and there's guidelines of how that all works, um, you know, uh, I feel a lot more free uh, to not be bound by uh, the confines of, of you know, uh, limitations um, or boundaries put on me by a company. Yeah. Um, which effectively at the moment, I mean, I, it's really hard to, to see where that's heading. So I, I just stay by myself uh, in terms of uh, I just put the music out there. Now, um, I'm not marketing it. I'm not promoting it uh, on purpose because, uh, because the music I'm writing and I'm, I'm about to release is very powerful. I think to me it is. It's, it's extremely uh, deep and, and meaningful to me. And I think there's a, a big message in there for a lot of people right now. So... I'm holding back a little bit on some of those releases because I want that first one, We Are Awakening, which is the one you're referring to, which I did with Kieran. Um, and by the way, Kieran and I, we trying to think of a name for, for you know, to put. So we thought of, well, John and Kieran. So the acronym, acronym basically is Jack. Yeah. Jack, cool. Jack Music. So mm -hmm. I, I just thought, look, just like short names. So Jack Music sound, sounded good. Um, so we released that on Jack Music. So it was just one, <laughs> one little song by itself. Uh, up there on the platforms, uh, which will shortly be followed by probably some more stuff by Jack Music and my own my own um, uh, music, which I've been writing and I've, I've been collecting uh, a, quite a, uh, a body of music, body of work, probably over the last 10 years. Yeah. I'm kind of like the George Harrison of In Excess. Like I've, I've had all this stuff sort of... <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've got that. <laughs> I've got that written in my notes here. I've gone. Do you ever feel like the George Harrison of excess? The longer the band went on, the more confident, <laughs> and maybe the more. I mean, so, a song like "Disappear" must have given you a lot of confidence, hitting top ten in America. Uh, must have been just a, a feeling of joy. I think at the time, yeah. not just not just because the commercial peak of that, but I think it was such a brilliant song. Had a sort of a Motowny sort of beat to it, and a yeah. soulfulness to it, and. All right. But that hitting a top 10, you know, biggest hit off the album must have been great for your confidence as a songwriter, you know? Yeah, you know, and look, of course, Hayden, and, but of course, you know, let me try and unpack that a little bit because, yes, like if I was just a really sort of superficial person and all I cared about was was stats and figures and and how, how well did it do and how much did it make and, and you know, you know, how many likes have I got? And all that stuff. I'm not that guy. I've never been that guy. I, you sure. know, so I've always had a really private life. And frankly, to me, um, what's important is that that I was really happy with it, and, and and it made it into an album, which I think was a really important album, and it, it was a very important message. Now, the fact that a lot of people got into it was just a blessing. I mean, that's just absolutely amazing. I never expected. It. I never have. I never push any of my music out there with any expectations whatsoever. That's why I, 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 I'm satisfied if, if four people like it, you know. It's because that's that's four genuine people who like that song genuinely. I'm okay with that, you know. What, um, was, the mess what was the message of the song? Well, look, Michael wrote those lyrics and I never, I never ever want to insert my own um, perspective on what Michael had in his soul while he wrote that 
when we were sharing a place in Hong Kong. Mm. But I think it's largely, again, very similar. Any song that usually I've written with Michael is generally about the kind of thing I'm into, you know, which is is just observation of, of our of our greater um, world we live in, you know. And so disappear, I think, is is that we go back to what you were just saying about, you know, if we look after the, the, the planet, you know, we won't have, uh, you know, flooding in Melbourne. Maybe, but maybe it's a bit more than that. You know, maybe it's it's um, it's a bit more responsibility about how we are consciously. So what I think Michael was saying, and this is just my interpretation because I did the music, okay, uh, was that when everything just looks so crazy, turn on the, the TV and it's just this, you know, barrage, 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 one after the other of shocking, 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 traumatic, traumatic, traumatic. And here, look, there's a cat stuck in a tree. Yeah. Let's get the cat down. So you kind of built up, you get a smack in the face, and then they the come story back. At the end. <laughs> yeah, and they just constantly get you on this, this point where you go, <clears throat> and so the whole idea was that song was to make it disappear. Just make all that negative stuff go away and then and really sit and feel in, in, in your own in your own space, what really is going on? Not necessarily what you're watching on television. And I think X was a maturity in lyric writing with the songs like The Stairs and Disappear and your own other composition, Faith in Each Other, that mm. then, you know, you go into communication off the next album, which is a bit of a similar thing about the media and, you know, around that Iraq war era, you know, with a lot of disinformation coming out there. It um, seemed like the more maturing part of In Excess, if I could be as, as Twee is saying that, I think it was seemingly a bit that way, you know? You're all oh, turning that's... 30 at that stage. I mean, you're all probably, you know, you've had you, you had the kick experience, but you're going into this next era, weren't you, of quite an interesting period. Sure. I mean, look, um, you know, and you're right. When you when you see when you pair someone's life to someone else's life, you're all moving at the same I mean, everyone's moving along at the same time, right? So whether you're three or I'm 30, um, you know, by the time I'm 60, then you're 33. So we're all moving along at the same time. So, you know, we're all evolving, we're all always getting older and we're always hopefully learning more and, and more experiences under our belt. Oh, that's a message from my wife. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I've just got a little free pass. I can give you another half hour. Oh, Woo! great. <laughs> <laughs> See, the you can put it out, spoken. it happens. The boss has spoken. <laughs> boss. We're going to dedicate this episode to your wife. Uh, yes, Jill. thank you, so, Kerry. Well, so, so every love song in the world, that's for her. <laughs> so, so, um, so what I'm saying is, is that, you know, I, and I always sort of parallel everything with my life with the Beatles because I'm such a huge Beatles fan at such a young age, you know, that... As, as you grow with the Beatles, you know, we're all growing together, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, yeah, but but when we look back at some of our early work, you know, one of the early albums we did, there's a song that says uh, All Those Years of Learning, right? I think it's on the second album. Well, you know, to me, that's an advanced lyric concept that that may not have sounded really very polished and, and, and uh, you know, really mature because we were, we were really young, but we were toying with and always had toyed with big grown-up concepts but when you're young and you haven't lived decades of, of ad adulthood mm. it's harder to craft something that sounds like you know you, you're in your 40s or 50s when you're really only when well, I was in my 18s or 19s or something so you I think we're always sort of talking about sometimes the same thing but yeah as you say you know we just our craft gets a bit more sophisticated we, we, we've got more tools uh, that we were able to to uh, reach and grab because we've had more experience for those tools to to kind of manifest. Well, within some of your songwriting, a lot of our listeners and patrons, and we might be paraphrasing here, but we're going to just call out some of your compositions or co-writes. We've got Old World, New World, Melting in the Sun, uh, I'm Over You, which is one of the great B-sides, Red Red Sun, great drumming, two of the force there, uh, Disappear, Faith in Each Other, Back Online. What a prophetic lyric, huh? Back Online. And that was come before... That was before we had the internet, right? I so, know. We prophetic, yeah. you and Michael. Yeah, on get back on that. Yeah. <laughs> so um and, and that's really typically wonderful, the type of I mean, you know, you could hear Andrew talk for hours about how wonderful is working with Michael because he was such a free spirit. Uh and uh while you know I or Andrew or anyone else he wrote with was being sort of super technical, you know, trying to I'm I'm operating tape machines and I'm trying to operate, you know, mic pre's and 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 Gain structures and all these sort of things, uh, and doing the music, 
um, which now I can do quite fine by myself and, and the lyrics and the whole thing. But in those days, it was a lot more, um, it just helped having Michael, who was just this free range, you know, um, art artist who was able to pluck uh, and, and and just concentrate on melodies and, and lyrics. So uh, back online, of course, what a great metaphor uh, that means so much more now than it probably did then. Yeah. Um, but of course, that's a saying that one would have said, yeah, I'm getting back online. Mind you, you know, when you were doing movie making or, or videos, you were still using uh, a, a synchronicity uh, technology to sync audio with visual. So that mm -hmm. was when you're online or offline. So there's mm -hmm. still a, a little bit of technical stuff in there. But I think obviously that's metaphoric for um, that we're getting back on track, you know, yeah. uh, that, that whatever those uh, hiccups were, those aberrations in our path, or what are obstacles or whatever they're, you know, they're melting away and we're able to to get a clearer path so we're getting back online i think that's probably what the message was there mark opitz shares a very interesting anecdote a few months ago we did a full moon dirty hearts retrospective and went through everything there and he was very very comp well, he's always been very complimentary of you and your uh he, he says there's two geniuses in excess one is andrew ferris and the other one's john ferris and you know the way mark talks he sort of has it very affirmative and says it like that so, <laughs> yeah. don't, argue, don't, don't i won't argue with that but i mean i, I might in my own my own space argue with that yes <laughs> by the way <laughs> by the way he says hello today uh, i saw mark i saw Mark. this is something i gotta tell you a funny anecdote okay so uh, <laughs> I, I, was st I was standing backstage just recently at the kiss concert uh, I was standing next to Carrie, my wife, and my kids, and uh, the manager of, of Kiss and um, and someone else. And I saw Mark Opitz walking past, right? And I was staring straight at him. And um, and as he's walking towards me, I could see he didn't, he didn't recognize me, okay? So I just said, excuse me, sir, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> Did you act like security? Yeah, because I, I, I had, uh, I've got, I don't know if I've got one here. Um, I've got like a, an operator cap. It's like a military operator's cap. And I had that kind of down like this, you know. Oh, He's right. like, oh, I'm Mark Opitson, uh, you know. And I'm like, okay. So, uh, and I was just. I was, oh, he kept it going. I'm, I'm, I'm just pushing his buttons and he's starting to get a bit, you know. And I'm going, Mark. And he's going, yeah. I'm going, it. it it's John Farris. And he's just, he's just like, could, he's, he went, whoa, completely caught him by, and it was hilarious. It was really funny. And then he oh. just, then, then we were hugging and it was like, we were oh, hugging. He's a right, he's great, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. He's, 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 he's a legend. Mark is, um, mm -hmm. you know, absolute, uh, he, he's a cultural treasure of this country, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, um, you know, we, you know, from time to time you have these, um, you know, people try to, to, to build organizations to recognize these sorts of things in the past. We've had, you know, Countdown Awards, we've had ARIA Awards, we've had all sorts of different things. You know, we've had APRA Awards, we have all these different types of things. But, you know, there, I don't think there really has been enough uh, support for Mark to be recognized for quite just the important, um, you know, cultural uh, uh, we, 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 treasure he is. we do our little bit. We call him the George Martin of Australia. That <laughs> tends to uh, float his boat a bit, given all these production credits. But um, two particular songs. Obviously, the he mentioned the the riff off the gift was something that was really a demo from you, and you brought along and almost made it to the final cut, I believe. I did. That's uh, my guitar playing. Oh, yeah. yeah, and which for us was a really interesting anecdote. We it, it didn't sound anything like Tim and Andrew and, and Gary when we heard it, but obviously now it makes sense. It comes from your deep canon of... Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 it's right. And that's what that's why I was always a big, ad, big advocate um, to share the, the love around and, and who's, you know, um, submitting songs and stuff is because like the Beatles, you have a, a broad smorgas to choose from. And, and so, of course, me and my drummer's hands, you know, and, and um, my, my take on the things and the fact that I'm not a proficient guitar player like the guitar players in excess are, I'm going to come up with a style that's going to be different. And so, therefore, while it's not technically brilliant, you know, it's, it's, it's offering something that's, that's a little bit unique. And so that's why it stood out. Uh, and what I had is a, a small Marshall uh, battery-operated amplifier. It's about this big. 
and it, it's, it's something you plug on your belt and, and plug and turn on. You can play electric guitar. It's got a little, little speaker right there. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I just I just put a microphone on. Um, I keep looking around because I've got a whole bunch of, I'm in my studio, so there's stuff everywhere. Um, I put a microphone on there and I just did the, the, the guitar part. And and it was really the, the glue that glued that song together. So it made the cut and Mark used it. So it was we, great. When I first. Fact, when a lot I of first... the stuff I wrote was mostly all the stuff, uh, except the, the middle eight bridge was pretty much all, all mine. Yeah. Well, that sounded, you know, without, you know, um, uh, going too much of a comparison, it, it really sounded you know, something like U2 at the time around that Akton Zeropa sort of time there with the the echoey sort of sounds here and delayed sort of stuff there. It did have that sort of sense to it, which was really a time when the band were reinventing itself and it was great for you to get the uh, the first single off the album, I guess, you know, for for Full Moon. And did you have yeah. to lobby lobby hard for your tracks to get on albums and things like that? Was there well, something there? I mean, where... Look, I um, don't believe anyone should have to lobby you for anything, you know, yeah. I mean, I'll part being in a band is that is that you have an, uh, you know uh, a group of people that you're you're free to express yourself. Um, you know when when there were uh, sort of certain guidelines that started to be introduced. Um, I'm kind of a rebel for me. I, that, that's just like waving a red flag to a bull. So I'm like you know rules. Sorry, not you know you know. I, I, so what I could see was a little gap in what was being presented to the the uh, songwriting uh, music of in excess was so the gift for me when I wrote that was simply uh, a kind of a direction that I thought would be good to have in a group of songs to glue that aspect of our music, which we're really good at. It's kind of rock funk, kind of like Lenny Kravitz meets uh, Marvin Gaye meets, um, what's that band, uh, Something in the Machine, what's it called? Uh, right. Uh, Way to the thing, yeah. So we've got we've got the 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 sort of this rising of of a lot of computer based music, which I've always been into. Okay, so I've always I've always had a hybrid element of my drumming. So I've always had technical rhythms mixed in with my freehand playing, and that's been my style. So I I kind of hybrid technology with, with freestyle you know yeah um, I loved I loved that part that um that I, I was listening to you say something about wildlife and you were given free range by Chris Thomas on wildlife is that right okay let me back back up a little bit well when Andrew would 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 um come to the table with with a song he's written uh you know Andrew would always uh, make mention every time that everything he did was you know was really thought about and it was really considered um, and and while I think that's absolutely true, it doesn't mean that when other people submit songs that they didn't consider what they were doing either and everything that they were bringing forward wasn't considered as well. So, <laughs> you know, it gets a funny area. It's mean, well, well. so what, what I'm saying is when Andrew would deliver a song and I would hear that he'd consider the drum part, I often would pull back and go, let's run with your, with your rhythm box that you come up with I'll augment on that or I'll just flirt around it and I'll just enhance what you've already done. Or if it's just a scratch and you want me to fill in my own composition drumming wise, I'll build a whole thing around underneath that song. Mm. Wildlife, of course, you know, there's that whole introduction which do did and did it did it did right? And there's just there's chaos, there's a bit of jazz fusion happening in there. And that's when I'm like the dog off the chain, so I'm doing you know, some pretty bizarre kind of off beats and, and that sort of stuff. And then whoosh, we bring it all down so it's really solid on that beat so that the verse has got a nice bed just to sort of, you know, that dynamic and then it can just explode again after the mm. chorus. So maybe that's what Chris Thomas is talking about. I'm not sure, but um, I think oh, at the end, at John, the end I'm of the just song, loving your passion still. This yeah. is brilliant. I'm feeling it. It's so good. I'm so glad you're still creating music for everybody. Oh, I am. I, I love it. I've got... Uh, a great toolbox here and I really enjoy writing and so my my songwriting journey has been run rather selfishly actually because um I, I just love it and, and when I feel really in touch with it and, and I really feel that, that you know mm. that there's this beautiful sort of information or energy or, or um love or what do you want to call it coming through me that to me being the conduit for that is, is the gift you know mm. like then when the song's finished, that's just like icing on, on, on the cake. And that's why Hayden, when we were referring to, you know, disappearing, reaching the charts and whatever, I, 
great, you know, but, but a song now that when you mention a song like old world, new world, to me, that's way more that hits my heart huge because yeah. you considered and remembered that, you know, we, we have a very special lady who's been with us from the start with the podcast. Her name is Foxy. She's uh, got red Indian origins and she, uh, that song probably means more to her and she probably cries more often over that lyric and that song than anything we've ever done. So for Foxy, uh, we'd like to share that with you. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> other one as well, uh, since we've commenced the podcast, and maybe I've influenced this a little bit too, uh, a song called Deepest Red probably would be the best B-side, and it's wrong to call it a B-side because, yeah, technically it was on one of the Heaven Sent single, but we think that's one of the songs that we just uh, are always a bit frustrated, never made it onto X or whatever, but we all collectively yeah. love it. Uh, yeah. Judas Kiss, Kiss of Betrayal, the the yeah. sonics of that are brilliant. Yeah, um, it's in my top five songs of any. Okay, um, I'm getting goosebumps when I think yeah. about that song. Right, yeah, okay. We love it. We get yeah. them as well. So please share yeah. your. We play uh, thoughts, a lot. <laughs> thoughts, we played a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. share us your insights on that one. Um, I'll start with one section of that that question. So, deepest red. I was personally disappointed that it didn't make the album because to me it meant so much to me. But see, I'm used to that. And, and being in a band and being with brothers, um, I learned so much about life, about just trusting what happens. You know, sometimes you're, damn it, I want that thing where I want it, I want this. And if everyone was like that, nothing would work, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it teaches you how, like with a family, okay, someone's really needy at the time, you're like, I want this, I want You know, you tend to sit there and go, okay, you know, me arguing it isn't going to help the situation. It's going to just elevate and escalate. Mm. So, so what now I'm learning is because it didn't make the album and you've discovered it and so many other people listen to this um, show might go, yeah, I know that song. I really like that song because it's made it more special. Yeah. 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 And I didn't see it at the time, you know, mm. but Deep the Thread, now we know that Michael's passed and it makes me even more, I get tear up just thinking about it, right? So... That that songwriting process was so amazing, you know, and the song. It just it, it just because you know how it goes, you know? yeah, yeah. So I was doing this sort of it was like a very melancholy sort of this this uh, overarching heart sort of that yeah. It just kept going, wow, it's just something talking to me here. Mm. And so when I did these chords and stuff and Martha, he was mm -mm -mm, I can hear him in the in, in the other room kind of going, no, no, no. And, and you can hear him humming away and, he, and he'd come in and he'd come in and um, and then he'd just start, he would just walk in. Like, so I'd be writing and then, he, and then sometimes the door just open and he'd come in and then he just, he was in another space and it just, and it just fell into his soul and he'd come in and he added it to it. So that's the, the kind of the emotion and the energy and the experience of writing it. But Going into the recording of it was really great, also because that was an uh, was it was an X was it? Yeah, I think it was a yeah. Chris Thomas production. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. And, and so recording it was just absolutely beautiful because um, because it was treated as a B side. When we tr transferred all the data that I'd written on my dem demos across onto multi track, most of that stuff is all there. It's all me, most of it. And then, of course, you know, augmented by the other guys. But but Chris used to like to keep the stuff I did on my demo. Um, that song has a very special uh, place in my heart because it, it again, it's like it doesn't matter to me if it's a hit or not. It's just that it was recorded and that people got has have access to it. Is, well, is, yeah, is, we we yeah. our listeners, you know, said I've always loved it. You know, having a platform that we do between B and I to put this podcast out we we've given it its its profile to it and you know the amount of people who have responded to it who maybe hadn't heard it has been huge and there are people who wow. have heard it and just letting you know it uh it, it's up there with a lot of the other other you know i won't say ballots but it probably tinges on a ballad but it's uh yeah i know yeah, it's, 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 saying, it's, I know. that's, it's, that's mm. yeah Sorry, Sorry so, sad, sadly it's not on itunes so no one can actually hear it or it's not even on an album no it's only on that B-side, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And this is something that I don't know. There's something about my life, something about me. I think what's happening, what's coming in the future is going to be more, I think this is where I step into my light probably a bit more. And I don't mean in, in fame and I don't mean in uh, popularity. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about 
as I walk further into a, a higher state of, of awareness and higher state of consciousness, these songs, they're coming with me, you know, I like they, 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 they suddenly make sense and they tie in, they mm -hmm. tie in to something that's a little bit more than just the, the, the uh, cookie cut album. So, so Deepest Red is to me a gem because you got to kind of scratch around and find it, you know. Yeah. And when you find it, you go, wow, I really love this. Well, you know, you don't, and it's up to you. But, yeah. but do you see what I'm saying? So to me, it makes it more special. I know, and, and that's, so I look at it with, I look at it fondly with a smile on my face going, that's the way that, that cookie crumbles. So it's cool. It, but it's, it, it has found its audience 30 years later in a weird and wonderful way, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to say thanks to everybody out there who's not only supported your platform and your podcast but who's been there for all those years even if it's minutes thank you like it's, it's all wonderful we all are from the same we're all cut from the same cloth and we're all going to the same place so you know we're all we're all in there together i just want to say thanks and just love everybody and uh just loving life and it's just so great there's people like you out there so thank you for being you and everything you're doing it's fantastic well, we hope you enjoyed part one of our interview with John Ferris. Part two will be coming up very soon. So make sure that you subscribe to our channel and you won't miss out. Listen in each week on your favorite listening platform and we will provide you with updated in excess news with more interviews, fan engagement and oh, so much more. Catch you soon. Slow as a time man.